teacher will give us understanding and insight, and we give you glory and praise for it as you confirm your word with signs following in Jesus' name, amen. So therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace to the end that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. So the scripture is saying here that we operate by faith so that we can get the promises of God by grace. Because faith is not works. And so this is the principle here, is that uh, we are now under grace and no longer under the law or under works. So therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace to the end or for the intent that the promise might be sure to all the seed. In other words, so that the promise might come into manifestation for the seed of Abraham. And we know that the seed of Abraham is Jesus Christ. And we are in that seed of Abraham. And so the promise is to all of us. Amen. Not only to those who are of the law. So this is not about the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham. That which is related to, parallel to, equal to, equated to the faith that Abraham had, have access to this grace and therefore to the promise. And he's the father of us all because he's the father of our faith. We know that God is our heavenly father. There's no dispute about that. So when the Bible says that Abraham is the father of us all, he's talking about he's the father of our faith. He's not the father that birthed us. He is the father of our faith. Now, so Jesus Christ is the door to the new covenant, which is the covenant of grace. And the covenant of grace is completely different to the covenant of law. We're talking today about praying according to grace. Praying according to grace. It's very, very important because when we do things in alignment with God's word, we get the results that God promised. When we don't do things in alignment with his word, we don't get the results that he promised. And so it's important for us to know how to pray according to grace, which is how God wants us to pray. So Jesus came to be the bridge between the old covenant and the new covenant. He lived under the law of Moses and fulfilled the law for us, for us. Very important. Jesus came and he fulfilled the law. He never sinned once in his life. Never had to apologize for anything. He lived a sinless and a perfect life, even according to the law. And the reason why he did that, he did that on your behalf and on my behalf. Can I hear amen? Amen. Glory to God. Now, he lived under the law of Moses. And fulfilled the law for us. Okay? He lived under the law of Moses. It's very important to realize that the actual New Testament does not begin with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The actual New Testament begins at the cross of Calvary. That is when the Old Testament actually ended. Jesus came as the last prophet of the Old Testament and the first prophet of the New Testament, okay? And he is the first and the last. And so Jesus Christ operated and ministered under the Old Covenant. At the time that he was walking on the earth, 
the temple was still there, the priests were there, the sacrifices were being made. It was only when he died on the cross that the temple curtain was torn from top to bottom, showing that it was the end of that era of the old covenant. And that was also the beginning and the opening of the door and access to the new covenant. So it's very important when you read your Bible that we read with that understanding. Because at first, it looks like, because Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are in the New Testament, it looks like they happen under the new covenant. They do not. They happen and occur under the old covenant. And Jesus Christ is the bridge between the old covenant and the new covenant. And this becomes very important when we begin to study the word of God, particularly in this area of grace. So when he was crucified, he was the Lamb of God who took away the sins of the world, paying the full penalty for man to be reconciled back to God in right relationship. And he removed the obstacle of sin and separation between us And God, praise the Lord. And by the shedding of his blood, he activated, he activated the dormant covenant of Abraham. The covenant of Abraham was already in place and waiting for it to be activated. What was was missing in the covenant of Abraham was the right sacrifice, the right blood sacrifice that would seal that covenant and activate it and make it valid. And the Lamb of God had not yet been sent, so it was suspended. And after 430 years, then the law was given, and then Jesus Christ came at the end of that era to activate the covenant that God made with Abraham many, many years before, which was a covenant of grace. It was a covenant of grace. And so, um, by shedding his blood, he activated the dormant covenant of Abraham, which was an everlasting covenant based on grace. Abraham did nothing in his own strength to deserve to be in covenant with God. God just called him out of his people. God just chose him. God just favored him. God decided to make a covenant with him. Abraham did not earn or deserve any of it. God blessed him, and he said his seed is going to be blessed without Abraham doing anything for it. And so the covenant with Abraham is a covenant, is the actual covenant of grace. All right, now we have to lay this foundation so that we can be very, very clear about where we're going. So when Jesus died, our Adamic nature was crucified together with him. And we also died to the law of Moses for righteousness through him. Let me explain that again because it's kind of... um, uh, Hard to follow. Okay, so Jesus comes, he fulfills the law. He, and he did it for our sake. Having fulfilled the law, we are identified with him. In other words, he took us into himself as the last Adam. And when he died on the cross, praise the Lord, he died as a man that fulfilled the law, but he also died as the one that identified with us and we were crucified with him. So Adam, the old man, was crucified with Christ. We were crucified with him on the cross. It's called identification. Um, And so when he died on the cross, we died to the law of Moses for righteousness. Got it? So we died to the law for using the law to gain righteousness, all right? And then, of course, he was buried and so forth. And um, let's see. All right. So 
he, when he ascended, he became our high priest after the order of Melchizedek. And as such, he became the mediator. He became the mediator of this new and everlasting or eternal covenant. The mediator means he was the go-between. And he is the go-between. He's the middleman, as I've said. He's the middleman to make sure that the covenant of Abraham, which is a covenant of grace, is fulfilled and manifested in our lives. And that's where his intercession works and takes place as he intercedes for us so that whatever God has promised through Abraham's uh, uh, covenant, then Jesus Christ stands on that and petitions as our advocate, as a legal term, as our advocate, he petitions the Father to make sure that what is in the wheel, because it's all about the wheel um, of the uh, of of God that is like in a legal will, a legal will, so that what is in the wheel, which is the covenant, can become available and accessible to us as believers. Not only that, he became the executor of the terms and conditions of the new covenant. He became the executor. An executor is the person that. When there is a wheel, someone has died, and then they leave a wheel. In order for that wheel to happen, an executor must be appointed. Yeah? An executor is the legal person or the appointed person that has the authority to distribute the assets. And Jesus Christ now is the executor of the wheel. He is the enforcer and the implementer through the Holy Spirit of that which belongs to you and to me. Glory to God. Okay. Now, he is also, the Bible says, I'm not going to give you scriptures right now. You're going to have to study this because I'm going to give you scriptures about other things today. He is also the guarantor of our eternal inheritance. Now, a guarantor is, is a person, let's say that you want to buy a house. Now, you don't have the credit for the house. So, they'll, say, they'll ask you, do you have a guarantor? Maybe you've got an uncle or your parents have the money and have the good credit. So, they'll say, what we will do For you to have this house, we need a guarantor, someone that has good credit, someone that has the income, okay? And they are going to sign on this house. And on the base of their credit and on the base of their financial strength, we'll let you own the house. But now what that means is this, is that if over time you end end up in trouble and you can't pay that mortgage, they don't come for you. They come for the guarantor, okay, who signed on your behalf. In other words, they have to make good on the mortgage that you can no longer pay. And Jesus Christ is our guarantor. Oh, I love this part. He is our guarantor that even if we don't match up to God's requirements of righteousness or even of anything else, Jesus himself will back us up and he will fill the gap, glory to God, so that the blessing and the covenant and the inheritance can still be ours and you can keep the house. Glory to God. There's no way that Jesus will default because he's the guarantor. Glory to God. That doesn't mean you're, being, you're going to be irresponsible, but it does mean that you are covered by a guarantor that will make sure that you get and you keep the goods that belong to you according to your inheritance. Isn't that good news? Glory to God. Hallelujah. 
And so these are powerful, powerful truths here. Now, praying according to grace is praying based on the completed work of Jesus Christ. Glory to God. What this means is that Jesus paid the price in full for our redemption, uh, and we're going to break it down. So someone say, it's paid for. Okay? It's paid for in full. When Jesus said, it is finished, he meant just that. He meant it's paid in full. There's nothing outstanding. Let me put it this way. It's like a person saying to you, um, I want you to go and enjoy a vacation, a cruise, around the world cruise for 40 days. Okay? All you have to do is show up. Just come to the ship. You're going to get the best suite. All right? And uh, when you come to the ship, you just show them this receipt or this card or whatever, and you have access to anything and everything on the ship. Why? Because it's already paid for. It's already paid for. Every meal, all your refreshments, all the entertainment, everything that you want is paid for. And this person's got deep pockets, and he paid for everything in advance. Now, if you choose to fast for 40 days while you're on the ship, that's on you. But the food is paid for. You can eat every day, three times a day, all day, if you want to. If you choose, you're not going to go to the spa, and you're not going to get a massage, and you're not going to get get into the sauna, and you're not going to go to swim, and you're not going to go to the gym, and it's on you, but it is paid for. This is what Jesus Christ did for us. When he redeemed us, he paid for everything in full and in advance. You had to pay nothing. Glory to God. Hallelujah. This is good news, isn't it? Yes, yeah. someone say paid in full. So Jesus paid in full for our redemption. Now let's break it down. Because now we get into the specifics of what he paid for. He paid for our sins to be forgiven. Can I hear amen? amen. Glory to God. So all our sins are paid for. Now, that doesn't give us a license to sin. Listen to my teaching on the gospel of grace because our nature is not the same anymore. We're not inclined or desiring to sin. We want to live for God. We want to live a holy life. We want to live righteously. And the empowerment of God is that we live a righteous and a holy life. However, our sins are provided for. Glory to God. Number two, our new birth and regeneration is paid for. So that didn't happen by works. It happened because of the grace of God that you and I were born again. Can I hear you loud? Amen. Someone say it's paid for. Our righteousness is paid for. The Bible says that we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So we're not just righteous. We don't just have right standing like we're good. That's not even what God is saying. That's not, that's not the fullness of it. He is saying that we are so good before him that we are as good as God. Woo! You are as good, as righteous as God is righteous because he has given you by grace the righteousness of God. Now, right there, right there, it's a very something I need to comment as, I, as we continue to lay the foundation. We're talking about praying according to grace. This is when we resist condemnation, guilt, and any such thing because we don't come to God in prayer because we've been good. 
We come to God in prayer because he has been good. Hallelujah. And we take his goodness, glory to God, his righteousness, and we stand before God in the righteousness of God. Because one of the big uh, tricks of the enemy is to bring guilt, shame, and condemnation to us as believers, particularly when it comes to the time of prayer. And now the enemy is reminding you of all the things you shouldn't have done or the things that you, you're supposed to do and you didn't do or said or thought. And now you're like, Ish, I can't pray. No, 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 no I'm not, I've not been good. No, we, God doesn't listen to your prayers because you have been good. God listens to your prayers because Jesus has been good for you and on your behalf. And when you come before God, it is Jesus standing before God. There's no difference as far as God is concerned because he sees the righteousness of Jesus. And so that gives us the boldness, glory to God, to come before God with a boldness because we're not coming cowering and I'm not worthy, I'm just a worm, I'm just a nobody. And, and no, that is false humility now. Because that's not true. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And he has made you and I worthy, glory to God, to come to the throne room of grace with boldness to receive grace and mercy to help in time of need. Can I hear you loud? Amen. Amen. We're still building the foundation. We're talking about the completed work of Jesus Christ and our redemption and what it is is in it. We're unpacking it now. So our deliverance, glory to God, is already accomplished. Now this one, I wish I had a little more time, but I'll explain it. The Bible says that Jesus has translated us from the power of darkness, amen, and brought us into the kingdom of the Lord's dear Son which means that he has delivered us from the realm of demonic oppression and he has brought us into the realm of his reign just because Jesus paid for it. Someone say, Jesus paid for it. You know, the Bible says you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. And half the time, ignorance is the problem. And if we knew what we are supposed to know, most of the challenges we face in life, we would not struggle as much for us to have answers or to have breakthroughs because they're all covered and paid for. And so even on that cruise ship I was talking about, your doctor visits are paid for. (laughs) That if you have to see the dentist and you have a toothache during that 40-day holiday... You're not going to be suffering for 40 days with a swollen mouth and uh, and pain. There are doctors there. There's a dentist there. There's there's a there's a clinic there, and all of that, all of it is covered. It's all paid for, including your deliverance. Someone say it's paid for. Glory to God. Now, when we got time, we'll unpack that one. But we're going somewhere. Our healing is paid for. The Bible says, by his stripes, we were healed. So, uh, it's not something that God has to think about to heal us. It's not something he has to debate in his mind. Is he going to heal you or not? No, he's already made provision. He's already decided that you're going to be healed. And by his stripes, we have been, it's already provided for whether it be physical healing, emotional healing, or mental healing, any kind of healing, Jesus Christ has already made provision for our healing. We're talking about the finished work of Christ through grace. Now, all of these things I've mentioned we're going to get into have implications of how you pray. Because the problem is that many times we're praying for things that are already available to us. And we're begging for things that God has already promised us. 
and we're trying to get things that we think we don't have, but you already have it. So, I've, so you know what happens when you already have something and you're looking for it. You'll never find it <laughs> because you already have it. Okay? And so many times um, this has huge implications in our prayer life because, because of some of the lack of knowledge in this area, people struggle and they don't see the results. And I'm, saying, I'm not saying that every prayer is going to be answered immediately. Now, I'm not saying that. But when we pray aright, we're going to see different results to when we are not praying right. All right, let's go on. What's provided for by Jesus Christ, paid in full, is our peace and relationship with God. The Bible says we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 5, verse 1 and 2. We can put that one up. Romans chapter 5, verse 1 and 2. Therefore, having been justified by faith, not by works, we have peace with God. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So God is not mad at you. God is not frustrated with you. God is not disappointed in you. Because God is not looking at you. (laughs) God is looking at Jesus. (laughs) And Jesus is in you, and you are in Jesus. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So God is happy with you. God is pleased with you. Someone needs to hear this. God is satisfied. Not because you have been and I have been so good. No, that's not what he's looking at. He's looking at Jesus, the guarantor, the one that paid for it, the the one who paid the bill. He's, he's happy, and he's not concerned, uh, he's not angry with you or me, praise God, because of what Jesus Christ has already done. You shall know the truth, the truth shall make you free. All right. By whom also we have access by faith. Through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. So through Christ, you notice that? It's only because God looks at us through Jesus that God is happy with us. If you were to look at us on our own, it would be a different story. But thank God we are hidden in Christ. Hallelujah. And Christ is in us. And so God is looking at Christ and is happy with Jesus. That is his beloved son in whom he is well pleased. Tell your neighbor God is pleased with you. Hallelujah. We need to hear that. Because we spend so much time battling accusations and senses of inferiority, coming short, not being enough. And our sufficiency is not of ourselves. Our sufficiency is of God. Jesus Christ has made you and I enough. Oh, that will preach. Glory to God. Praise the Lord. Tell your neighbor you are enough in Christ. That's the difference. Glory to God. All right. So what else is provided for? Our financial abundance is provided for. 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9. It's already provided for. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. It's, and uh, let's see what it says here. For you know, watch this, look at this. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you don't expect that word grace to be there. But it's talking about how this has been provided for by grace. This is the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich... And it's not just talking about spiritual riches here because you look at the context of the scripture. It's talking about finances. It says, though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor that you through his poverty might be made 
rich or become rich. Someone say amen. So even our financial abundance is already paid for. Glory to God. Hallelujah. <laughs> Woo. It's already paid for. So we're not trying to earn God's abundance. We're not trying to work for it. But we are simply trying to cooperate with God in whatever way by faith that we need to in order to access it. But that's a whole other teaching. We're going to get to that another time. So let's talk about this one now. What, is, what else is provided for is our personal restoration. Our personal restoration. Luke chapter 4, verse 18 and 19. I'm teaching. I'm not trying to preach because I want you to really get this because we need to know how to pray according to grace. Not according to works or according to the law. It says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. This is Jesus speaking, referring to a prophet's prophecy from Isaiah, which is about himself. He says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives. You see that deliverance there? Do you see the deliverance from poverty? And recovering of sight to the blind. You see healing there? To set at liberty, you see freedom from oppression there, deliverance, liberty to those who are oppressed to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor or the acceptable year of the Lord. Now, if you don't know this, the acceptable year of the Lord is the year of Jubilee. The year of Jubilee took place every 50 years. On the 49th year into the 50th year, what was supposed to happen is that whatever people lost, may they own some property, they own whatever it was, assets they had, and they had to mortgage them or, uh, or someone repossess them uh, in the process of time. On that 50th year, everything was supposed to be restored. It was supposed to come back to them, but they never, ever practiced it. Because Jesus says, the reason you never practiced is because you needed me for that to happen. And he says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach this good news to the poor, etc., etc., and to declare, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord or the year of Jubilee. And so even our restoration is provided for in Christ Jesus. Can I hear you loud? Amen. Amen. Glory to God. After this, you're going to start praying differently. You're going to start praying differently, and you're going to start praying more effectively. Okay? No matter how sincere your prayers are, but if they are amiss, you miss the mark. And sometimes it's not really our fault. We just don't know how to pray any different. That's because that's how we know how to pray. Or that's how we were taught how to pray. And then um, and, and we just keep on doing it. But when you're praying according to grace, you find that the way that you pray begins to change. Something else that's provided for is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And our union with God. I'm going to move quickly now. I haven't got this time to unpack all of this. All of this is provided for. Our authority over the world. Our authority over the world is already paid for. This is the victory that overcomes the world. Even our faith. Can I hear you loud? Amen. Someone say, it's paid for. So you have authority over the world. We have authority over the flesh. That is, through the life of Christ within us, through the Spirit, we crucify the deeds of the body. It's provided for. Now, we have to learn how to grow in that. But even overcoming the flesh and the lust of the flesh and the desires of the flesh and the works of the flesh is provided for in Christ Jesus. Can I hear you loud? Amen. Amen. Now, here's a big one, which we're going to unpack another time. Dominion over the demonic realm is already provided for. Let me give you the word on this. 
Colossians chapter 2, verse 13 to 15. Colossians chapter 2, verse 13 to 15. It says, And you, being dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. We have talked about that, that all our sins have been forgiven. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. And we're talking about the law here and its accusations. That has been blotted out, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. Here's the part we want to get to. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. So Jesus already spoiled principalities and powers and triumphed over them when he went down to the lower parts of the earth. And the Bible says there he spoiled principalities and powers. He crushed the head of the serpent and he rose again from the dead, amen, and said, all power has been given unto me in heaven and on earth. And now the name of Jesus has authority in heaven on earth and under the earth. Glory to God, because Jesus went there and he spoiled them. He wrecked them. He ruined them. He stripped them. He embarrassed them. Glory to God. So even when it comes to spiritual warfare, we pray differently when it comes to understanding grace as opposed to praying by the law. Okay, we, we, will, we will get into this because we're going to get into the application um, tonight as well. But what we're saying now is that Jesus Christ has paid for our dominion over the demonic realm. Someone say, it's paid for. Now, what we do is exercise it. What we do is to implement that, that authority. What we do is apply the authority. But it's already provided for. And so the Bible talks about we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. It's not talking about the fact that we are trying to do what Jesus has not succeeded in doing. We're trying to defeat them. No, they're already defeated, but we are exercising and implementing the defeat. We are executing it. Let me give you an example. When a person is accused of a crime and they go to court, they go through the process and they are found guilty. That is the legal process. Now they are sentenced, yeah? They are sentenced to serve a certain amount of time in jail, okay? That's the sentence. The implementation of the sentence is not done by the judge. It's not done by the attorney. The implementation of the sentence is done by the police and by the uh, prison system. So you see, Satan has already been judged. He's already been spoiled and Jesus was the judge that did it. He did his job and then he handed it over to us and said, now you must implement. Put him in jail. Now, if we let him run loose, that's on us. If we don't bind him and incarcerate him and lock him up, the judge doesn't come down and say, where is he? Where is he? I'm going to find him. I'm going to find him. I'm going to lock him up myself. No, he's done his job. And so it's our job now to implement what Jesus has already done. Glory to God. But we are not trying to do what Jesus has done. He's already spoiled. He's in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. And we need to renew our minds on this. Because sometimes we magnify the devil and we undo what Jesus has done in our own minds. Because we think that, you know, somehow he still, you know, has got all that power and all that authority that uh, he thinks he has or wants us to think he has, and he doesn't have it. But if you believe he has it, he's going to act like he does. 
So another thing that Jesus completed is making provision. This is a good one of divine interventions and miracles. Look at Galatians chapter 3, verse 1 to 5. This is huge. That Jesus has made provision for all the miracles you'll ever need. It doesn't mean they're manifested, but he's made provision. Okay? He says, Oh foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? Before whose eyes... Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified. Let's go on. This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive, watch this, did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? In other words, did you receive the Holy Spirit by working for Him or working to get Him or deserving Him Or did you receive the Spirit by grace through faith? That's all you had to do was to believe. All right. Are you so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? Okay. Let's go on. Have you suffered so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Verse 5. This is where I want us to go. Therefore, he who supplies the Spirit to you and what? Works miracles among you. Does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Ooh. This is big. Because what this is saying is that even miracles are not the works of men. They are the works of God's grace that we access by faith because we know they are provided. So every miracle you will ever need has already been paid for. All Jesus is waiting for you to do is to access those miracles by your faith. And not by your works. There's no way you can work for them, deserve them, you know, uh, or whatever, earn them. The Lord works miracles by the hearing of faith. And faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So, there's another one. And then we're going to build on this. The blessing of Abraham is accessible to us and becomes our portion By grace, it's provided for. The blessing of Abraham is paid for. Someone say, it's paid for. Galatians 3, verse 13 and 14. So someone say, I'm blessed. Say it like you believe it. I'm blessed. Glory to God. What makes you say you're blessed is because the Bible says you're blessed. It has nothing to do with how you feel, how you look, and what your financial situation is like. Uh, and, you know, it's got to do with the truth that Jesus already made provision for you to be blessed. And so we're operating under the blessing. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, curse is everyone who hangs on a tree. Pause. So when you are in Christ, you can no longer be under the curse. And you can no longer be under a curse. A curse cannot stay in your life if you know it. It doesn't matter who's involved. Oh, the glory to God. It doesn't matter which witch or wizard or sangomas or whatever, tagatis, baloyi, you name the whatever they can try and put on you when you know who you are in Christ and what Jesus has done. You know that all will happen. It will just backfire. It will just boomerang, but it won't land on you. It may land somewhere, but you cannot be cursed. See, Satan works on our ignorance. He really does. He really does. And he makes us not realize or forget that Jesus has made a provision so that you can live curse-free. 
I decree that you are curse free in the name of Jesus. That's not because I just said it. It's because the Bible says it. Glory to God. And whom God has blessed, no man can curse. Glory to God. So you're living a blessed life. Glory to God. Now that will begin to change how you pray. Remember, there's a difference between something being made available to you and something that you actually are experiencing. Are you with me? Okay. So Jesus Christ has made these things available and the teaching is so that you and I can learn how to access for ourselves what he has already paid for. That this is how you access what's on this cruise ship with all of its benefits, okay? But you've got to go there to the dining room and you've got to go and, and, and show them your room number, your key, whatever you need to do. I have not yet been on a cruise, by the way, but it will happen in Jesus' name. But this is just my understanding of what happens there. <laughs> And that's one of my dreams is to go on a big cruise with my wife. But I know that somebody one time went on a cruise. And um, (laughs) after about a week on the cruise, one of the people, the staff, noticed that this person was just staying in their room all the time. And they never came out for meals. And, you know, they would just walk around and then they'd go back to their room. And he said, this person, I've never seen them go to the... And there are so many dining rooms, so many restaurants that you, you can go Chinese, you can go uh, French, you can go Jamaican, you can go. Uh, he sort of, and, and there's all this in his room. He, and one day he asked me, Excuse me, sir, I want to find out why don't you eat? The man said, No, I, I, I don't have the money. I just paid to be on this cruise. And uh, I don't have extra money, so I decided I would just go on this cruise. It's just a 10-day cruise. I've just got three days left. Um, I'm just drinking my water and just enjoying the sights and the, and the sea and, and all this. The man said, the, the, the staff member said, do you know that everything is paid for? You can eat anything you want. In any of these restaurants, the man said, really? Are you sure? The man said, yeah, show me your ticket. And and there, on the ticket, paid for. That many times is us as Christians. And we think that all we have is our sins are forgiven, we're going to heaven. And everything else you have to pay. You must work hard. Now you must work hard. You must sweat. To enjoy anything on this cruise is extra charge. (laughs) And the Bible tells us, no, it is paid for. But you have to believe it. That it's already provided and it is paid for. In full. Glory to God. That is grace. Mm. And so... We can add to this list anything else that you may ask for. Jesus told us, ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. In other words, it's all paid for on the cruise, but if there's anything that's not been mentioned specifically, just ask a crew member, they'll tell you where to go. And you can have it. Ask. It's paid for. Seek. You're going to find it. Knock, hallelujah, and the door shall be opened. There's no locked door over in your life in Jesus' name. God has set open doors for you and open doors for me, hallelujah. And the Bible says the promise of God in Christ Jesus are yes and they are amen. There is no no. There is no no. How can a person pay for you advance and say, yes, you can enjoy the gym. It's paid for. And then when you go to the gym, they say, no, you can't come in. Ibo. How can it be paid for? And then you tell me no access for me. 
and I've got the ticket here that says I have access. No, somebody's lying. Either they lied that it was paid for, or you at the door are lying that I can't come in. Get out of my way. It's paid for. Okay? That's the kind of violence that we need to have when it comes to prayer. To say, I'm not begging for this. I didn't pay for it. Jesus paid for it. He paid in full. So ask, you shall receive. Seek, you shall find. Knock, it shall be opened unto you. I'm taking what belongs to me in the name of Jesus. Now, if you want to live in the basement or in the kitchen or in the scullery, it's up to you. I want to live in the best suite in the, in the whole ship. It's paid for. <laughs> and some people think it's more holy to just say, no, just give me a little hole somewhere. I'll join the rats. <laughs> and they think it's humility. No, it's not humility. There's a lack of intellect involved somewhere here. When you can go to the best suite and enjoy everything and you prefer to live in a hole somewhere in the pantry of the kitchen. And say, no, I, I, I just want, so long as I can make it, so long as I'm just okay, so long as I, I can just pay my bills, so long as I'm healthy, and that's it, that's all. Lord, I, I don't want a lot. He's not asking you. He's already told you. It's paid for. Now, it's up to you what you want to enjoy and what you don't want to enjoy. If you don't want to go to the sauna, don't go. But don't condemn someone else for going. If you don't want the best suite, then go to the cabin you like. But don't blame the person that's living in the best suite. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And don't be envious because they're there. You can be there too. So these things are very fundamental and very important for us to understand so we can pray according to grace. So praying according to the law is praying according to works. Works. It is trying to work for, sweat for, earn, or deserve God's response to your prayers. Jesus has already earned God's attention, favor, and response to your prayers. Can I hear you loud? Amen. So praying based on what he has already accomplished and provided, which is praying by grace, is completely different to praying according to the law. It is praying from a place of relationship and rest. Now this is going to change your world. Because here, yeah, let's, let's just unpack this now and get into examples of praying according to works or praying according to legalism. Number one, praying based on duration. In other words, how long you pray. The thought that the longer I pray itself is going to guarantee a faster answer. Now, what did Jesus say about that? He says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 7 to 8, he says, and when you pray, Matthew 6, verse 7 to 8, he says, when you pray, do not use vain repetitions. It doesn't improve the prayer to say the same thing over and over, and God heard you the first time. Don't use vain repetitions as the heathen do. Give me this car, Lord. 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 This car, Lord. How many times are you going to say that? Because I heard you the first time. That's not how the heathen pray. Because they think this is by some kind of formula or repetition of some kind. He says, when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. So what we're saying here, listen now. 
God does not answer your prayers because they are long. God will listen to you until you finish. But it's not the length of prayer. What I'm talking about is legalism. Let me give you an example. If I don't pray for one hour, nah, I have not prayed. No, Jesus didn't say you must pray for an hour. He says to his disciples when he was going to get seven, could you not stay with me at least an hour? But he wasn't making a law out of it. He was making a statement to say, guys, you have no idea what I'm facing here. I'm about to be crucified. I'm about to be beaten to death and bleed to death. And you can't even stay for an hour. Is that sacrifice too much for you guys? That's all he was saying. He wasn't saying that you must pray for an hour for God to answer. See, you see the difference? That is legalism. So God doesn't answer your prayers because you prayed three hours, seven hours, 18 hours. Uh, no. God answers because He's already made provision, He's promised. And he's going to do it. So the real critical issue is my faith. It's not so much how long I pray. I'm going to talk about, you know, this thing of, of um, you know, length of prayer and so forth. But it's not a legalistic thing. Another way that we pray according to works is praying according to geographical location. Or a specific place. Jesus is speaking in John chapter 4 verse 21 to verse 24 here. John chapter 4 verse 21 to 24. He says, Jesus said unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither on this mountain. You see the location. Geographical location. She was a, 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 a Samaritan. And they believed that on the mount, on a certain mountain, um, that is where they need to pray. And they can't pray anywhere else. And Jesus says, believe me, the hour is coming when you shall neither in this mountain, nor yet at Jerusalem, the holy city so-called. Jesus says, you're not going to be praying based on location. He says, you shall not worship the Father based on a building or a place. Ye worship, you know not what. We know what we worship for salvations of the Jews. But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. So Jesus is saying this era that God will hear your prayers if you are in Jerusalem in the temple, or in the synagogue, and that's the only place he's going to answer your prayer, is coming to an end at this point. It did. So it's religious to say, God will hear my prayers only when I'm in the church building. No. The reason why we gather is an additional reason, and that is because there's power in agreement. And there's fellowship when we pray together. And we can encourage each other in prayer. But whether you're praying in the building or you're praying in the car, amen somebody. Doesn't matter where you are, there is no better place to pray <laughs> than another. It is religious to think that God will hear my prayers when I'm in the one room of the house as opposed to another. Okay, And so these are, this is legalism that contaminates prayer. Some of the most powerful prayers are prayed in the most unusual places. Okay, When we pray according to specific times, this is a biggie. When we pray according to specific times, we enter into legalism. And I'm talking about religious Adherence that God will only hear me if I pray at midnight. Or if I pray at 6 o'clock in the morning. And if I don't pray at that time, God is not going to hear me. My prayers are more powerful. 
when I pray at 3 o'clock in the morning. What? what? Let me, let me, <laughs> let me give you some scripture. Oh, God, help us. Galatians, no, because people are tied up in knots about these things. They seriously are. Galatians 4 verse 9 to 10 says, But now that you have come to know God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you turn again to the weak and beggarly elements? This is just elementary stuff. This is preschool. To which you desire again to be in bondage. What is he talking about? Tell us, Paul. You observe days and months and seasons and years. And you think that because it's year so and so, then this can happen, but it couldn't happen last year. Nonsense. You think it's month so and so. So the only things that can happen this month is one, two, three. Nonsense. You think that it's new moon and I must be spraying into the nonsense. This is legalism. God doesn't hear your prayers because it's the new moon and then you miss it by one day. Eyes, you're late. Amba. Haibu. Nonsense. You have drunk so much stuff that it's tied us up and you read your Bible. Because it doesn't matter. It's about how the Holy Spirit leads you. If God leads you and God speaks to you and say, I want you to pray at this time. Or I want to pray this week. Or I want to fast. Some, okay, be led by the Spirit. of the, But it's not a religion. Because next time it may be different. And we hold on to things. That we shouldn't hold on to. <laughs> and there are people, hey, Magid, I've got books. People would come and teach on these things and heavy revelation, praying through the gates of time. Please say, Ah, is here again, my daughter. Ah, no, please. <laughs> we are under many burdens. Now we must be there fasting three days, seven days every month. We must be fasting and praying on that time. Otherwise, we miss the gate. We miss the time. Otherwise, now this whole month is messed up. Where did you get these things, Mazalwane? Sibutanje Udoti. And we put them into our prayer life. And when these things trouble us, now we've got a problem. And we enter into condemnation. Yes. Enter into guilt. At first it sounds wonderful. Sure. I ain't seen my revelation. It's heavy, heavy revelation. Pray in the new moon. Have you heard such a thing before? Hey, Bazalwan, I didn't know. I didn't know. Ah, no wonder the devil's been so busy. I have not been praying in the new moon. He says, You are bewitched, Uloyiwe. Uloyiwe, you've been targeted. Snap out of it. He says, You're observing days. It doesn't matter which day. And people make a big deal what day it is. It's moon day. It's Thor's day. It's not Saturday. It's not Sunday. It's the Lord's day. It's a da cha 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 hi. Doesn't matter what day it is. The Lord is the same. Yesterday, today, and forever. We have access to the throne of grace. It doesn't matter what day of the week. 
what month it is, what year it is. I'm not talking about prophetic direction to say this is what God wants to do this year. Well, that's another matter. And even then, that's a check that people must catch according to your faith. God is trying to direct our faith in a certain direction. That's not a problem. But the point is that there is no better time to pray than another time. Your prayers are not heard better on Sunday than they are on Friday night. (laughs) They're heard every day. Every day. Anytime we come to the throne room. I'm talking about legalism. Praying according to grace, not according to the burdens that people put on us. I, I've been there. I tried it. Hey, you don't sleep, eh? Agulalwa. Sure. Agulalwa. Telling you. Oh, you must pray this time. Cling. Hey. Oh, Shanda. You just but oh, time to get up. Just when he gets, I had there we go. Who's all pumlanin? When are you going to rest? Who's all like that? Who's all cool? No, prayer is not about slavery. Prayer is about a relationship. It's dynamic. It's not the same every time. If you're praying in the same way all the time, you're stuck. You're stuck. You need to move and learn that this thing is dynamic. I'll I'll get into that. I'm helping somebody I know. Now, that is not to say that discipline is not there. Because you must not confuse discipline with legalism. I'm talking about discipline in prayer. If you choose to wake up at five in the morning or three to pray, it's not a religious thing. It's a discipline thing. And discipline is good. It's good for you to have a regular time of prayer, even a regular place of prayer. But that's not because God's not going to hear you anywhere else. It's because you choose to implement a discipline. Say, why? Because discipline is how we become good stewards of our time and other things and how we achieve personal mastery and excellence. You cannot achieve personal mastery without discipline, self-discipline. So yes, there's a place for discipline, but it's not because it's a holier time. It's because... That's how you feel led or that's how you choose to discipline yourself when it comes to prayer. And you should keep that discipline. But that doesn't mean if someone prayed three hours before, God didn't hear them. But God is hearing you because you're praying at that particular time. No. We have prayer watches because it's a discipline to say, okay, I'll be there at five. It's just a discipline. It's an agreement to say that's when we're going to pray online. That's when we're going to meet. It's a discipline. We're going to be here for prayer and uh, at this time. And we come. To, it's a discipline. But it does not mean that God won't hear us if we pray at other times. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Okay. Now, when people pray according to certain dress codes or attires, it's also religious. It's legalism. <laughs> And I grew up in a church where you couldn't preach like this. Ha! Fundis! Koki Pogat! Ah! Ka uwile! Uwile! Ah! No ma! Na ma! Ya ma tegi! E son tu eni! Utunkulu ya muzo anje! Do you think God hears him? What is that? Does God care? (laughs) Does God have a problem with your genes? He does not have a problem with your genes. He's got an issue with our hearts. If the clothes are in the right place and the heart is in the wrong place, he's concerned about that heart. No matter how we dress. 
Okay? So God is not concerned about those things. And I want to hit on some things here because sometimes we, 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 we use things like shofars and I have a talith, I've got prayer, uh, what you call uh, cloths and that I use sometimes. But I've learned one thing about these things. Don't put your faith in them. If you want to use them, use them. But it's not that God won't hear you because you don't use them. If you led to use your talith, which is the, you know, the prayer cloth, some people are religious about it. That they must wear their talith, their prayer cloth. Yeah, now God is going to hear. <laughs> no. God hears you because of Jesus. That's the only reason he hears. Because Jesus made it possible. And he paid the price. And he said, come in my name. Okay? So, a dress code is not the issue when it comes to prayer. It's not. You know, I, I could come here in my shorts. Somebody would say, ha! Ah, that's too far, possibly. Too far. <laughs> We can't be concentrating and seeing your knees, eyeball. And that's why I don't wear the shorts. Because you can't concentrate. <laughs> not because there's more anointing when my knees are not visible. Because you've got a problem. <laughs> but God doesn't have a problem. <laughs> no. We must get religion out. Of our lives, out of our prayer life, get back to relationship. Yeah. Okay. You know, um, <laughs> let me go on. Praying according to rituals and routines. Rituals and routines. Um, the rituals I'm talking about here is religious fasting. For example, can become a religious routine. Now, remember I talk about discipline. The main reason for fasting is not to twist God's opinion. It doesn't make God listen to you better. The reason for fasting is to crucify and discipline our flesh. We are bringing ourselves under subjection by denying ourselves of food so that our flesh doesn't give our spirit a problem. Are you with me? It doesn't mean that because you fasted 20 days, 21 days, 40 days, it's not a hunger strike to say now God is going to hear me. Yeah, I fasted 40 days. Now heaven must open. No. Open, heaven is already open. It's not opening because of your fasting. Heaven is open. You have access. Glory to God. But don't make it a religious thing. Let it be a discipline. That you discipline yourself, whether it's once a week and you no, know, I fast at least one day a week. Sometimes my, my wife and I fast three, four days a week. It, it depends how the Holy Spirit leads us. It's a discipline because we've got to keep this flesh under. So that when it comes time to prayer, I don't have a problem. I can pray. But if you let this flesh go, when it comes time to pray, your flesh will fight you. And you won't be able to pray. So that's why we fast. It's not because we are earning any favors from God. See, this is the religious stuff that gets us all knotted up. And then when things don't happen, we end up being frustrated. And you know why it doesn't happen? It's because when you do it by works, then it doesn't work. When we think that we are going to deserve it and earn for it and work for it, then it doesn't work. If I think that God's going to, you know, definitely respond to me now that I've fasted and prayed and, you know, I'm looking and feeling like a raisin and a prune at the same time. 
Now, now for sure. We are born in the now go so you are but and now God must hear I'm on a hunger strike. No. In fact, you just spoiled the prayer. You just spoiled it. Because now you think that that's going to make God move. No. If God leads you to do it, do it. And by all means, I want to repeat myself, we must have disciplines around these things. But we must understand that discipline is not the same thing as works. Because discipline is for us. It's not for earning brownie points with God. Okay. Now, praying based on human righteousness is another problem. And fighting for the victory, listen to me, fighting for the victory through human effort instead of through faith in the finished work of Christ is works. Oh, now I wish I had more time. Fighting for the victory. Listen, we don't fight for victory. We fight from his victory. Let me say it again. We don't fight for victory. We fight from his victory. Do you understand the difference? So there's a different fight now. When you're fighting to, to, to win. That's fighting for victory. <laughs> now you're fighting for victory. But when you're fighting from victory, boom, you're going down. <laughs> boom, boom. <laughs> hey, this is it. When... See, now you're fighting from a different position of victory. Whose victory? Jesus Christ's victory. Someone say amen. Amen. So even how we fight is not the same when we're praying through grace as opposed to praying through works. Trying to get something that Jesus has already given to us. Someone say, he has given me the victory. Now it's for me to enforce the victory that I already have. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 4, verse 8 to 11. And we're going to wind down and we're going to get into a season, a time of prayer. But this is important, this is very important, that we take it to another level. Amen. I didn't know all this all my life. We learn as we go. Amen. No one knows everything at any time. Some things you think you know, you learn, you realize, I, uh, I got it. You know, I've, I've had to pray for prayer warriors who almost lost their minds because of ignorance years ago. Because we were praying ignorantly. And instead of praying according to the word of God, they were being beaten up by the devil. Yeah. I know some who went into prayer movements and lost their minds. Because they love prayer more than they love God. There's a difference. Hey, tell your neighbor, hey. (laughs) Not everybody loves prayer loves God. Not everybody that loves worship loves God. Not everybody loves church, loves God. There are people who love prayer, but they don't care for God. Sounds like a contradiction. It is. They love the feeling, the the climate, the emotions of prayer. Yeah, I'm doing something here. 
But when it comes to loving God, it's another story. We must love God. Prayer is communicating with God. So sometimes we have to free people from serious problems. Someone I know who was in this church years ago got involved in one of these prayer movements. He's in the mental asylum. He was an accountant. Had two houses, single, cars, lost everything. Because of these false doctrines. Praying at all hours, all day, all night. You will lose your mind. You know, <laughs> and it didn't happen just one case. Many. Many. Lost their jobs. Lost their careers. Lost their business. Just Day and night, day and night, don't sleep. Like when? <laughs> yeah. And sometimes that's how they see us prayer warriors who are praying right. They think we've lost our minds because of such people. No. Prayer is a relationship with God. I've learned to discipline myself when I come before God. I've learned unless there's a burden on my heart, then I must unload the burden. But if there's no real burden, I've learned just wait. Let him lead you as to how to pray. Because otherwise we end up in these rituals and routines, okay? And we get stuck there. And meantime, we don't see answers. Oh, here we are. For if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not afterward have spoken of another day. Go on. There remains therefore a rest. For the people of God. Verse 10. For he who has entered his rest. That's the emphasis. He who has entered his rest. Has himself also ceased. From his works. As as God did from his. Let me explain that. When the Bible talks about. The rest. Of God. Or the rest of Jesus. Is talking about the fact that Jesus fought the battles. Jesus paid the price. He finished the work. And then he rested. Because it was already done. Now, we enter into his rest. We don't have to do all that. We enter into his rest. And believe it's done. I've said that already today. So the Bible says, for he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from doing things by works. Doing things by works, even as God rested on the seventh day. I think there's one more verse here. Let us therefore be diligent. Yes, because another version says labor. It's not the correct word. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest. Oh, glory. Lest, watch this, anyone fall according to the same example of the Israelites of disobedience or unbelief. So when they say, you know, the church, they used to say, they're completely misquoting things because this is falling. When we end up doing things by our own flesh, trying to earn our way, we have fallen from grace. 
siwile emseni. It's not just talking about a person sinned and committed some sins with horns. Not just talking about that. This is what the Bible is talking about. This one has fallen. And so we must be diligent, be careful to enter his rest and not, God help us, do things according to our works, trying to earn and deserve and, and, and buy things with our works as the children of Israel did and they fell short of what God had to them, had for them rather, and fell by the same example of unbelief in another scripture. So, we affirm and enforce our God-given victory. How? Remember, we're not trying to get our victory by works. We're not trying to fight for our victory. We are affirming and enforcing. Someone say, affirm and enforce. We affirm and enforce our victory that is given to us by God through thanksgiving, faith decrees, and declarations. The reason, when you start entering into this dimension of grace, you begin to realize that really part of how we pray is just to thank Him. Lord, I thank you that by your stripes I'm healed. I thank you've made provision for me. I thank you, Lord, that you have already made provision for my finances. I thank you, Lord, that you became poor, that I might become rich. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that I've been translated from the power. Are you following what I'm saying? You're thanking God, and in thanking God, you are affirming. You are endorsing. You are establishing. What Jesus has already done, you are entering into his rest. And then you make decrees and say, my God shall supply all of my need. Father, I decree and declare my needs are met. My bills are paid. Money comes from the north, south, east, and west. I decree that by your stripes I am healed. Now you're praying from a place of victory. You're not praying for, are you hearing what I'm saying? I'm trying to help somebody here. Okay? And this is, you find a lot, not all, because there's many types of prayer. There's petition, there's intercession, there's um, all kinds of different types. And every place, every kind of prayer has its place. But what you'll find is that when you're praying from a place of grace, you first have to establish your feet in what Jesus has done. Then you pray from there and you say, now based on what Lord Jesus you have already provided and what you've already promised, asking that you do ABC because I know you've already provided it for me. Are you, are you following what I'm saying? Glory to God. So that's how we affirm and enforce our victory. Now, there's also a place for persistence in prayer. Persistence in prayer. Jesus says, men ought always to pray and not to faint. So what he's saying here is that there's a place for persistence in prayer. It's not about vain repetitions. It's about the fact that the Holy Spirit has not released you yet from that prayer. Now, this is a mystery. It sounds like a contradiction, but it's not. But when the Holy Spirit gives you an unction to pray, and then he gives you an unction to continue to pray, it's because there's a need to continue to pray. But it's not about works. It's about obedience. But once that burden is lifted, you start praying. You start praising. And thanking God. So there is a place for persistence in prayer. And then we talk about prevailing in prayer. And there's a time when you have to just push in the spirit, asserting your authority and the finished work of Christ on that situation until it bows. Just like a bad dog. That if it's coming after you, 
and you, you don't want to run anymore, you turn around and say, sit down, or whatever other words you may use at your own discretion. <laughs> okay, you assert yourself. So, hi, Bo. You pick up a stone or look like you pick up a stone. You, yeah. There's a place for that. Because this devil can be persistent also. So we're not saying that there should be no persistence in prayer. We're saying there should be no religiousness and ritual and routine. But we must be led. That's the difference. Be led by the Spirit of the living God. And then the last one here is when people pray for a religious show to appear pious or religious to others. And Jesus said that we shouldn't do that. Praying for show. That's Matthew 6, verse 5 and 6. I've covered some of the ways that the enemy can entrap people to pray according to works. And I'm closing with this and then we're going to pray. Legalism will destroy your relationship with God and your prayer life. Because the letter kills. A lot of people's prayer lives are <laughs> clinically dead. And it's not because they haven't been praying. It's because they've been praying religious prayers. Legalistic prayers. Instead of praying based on relationship. Talking about relationship. <laughs> it happened a few weeks ago. I have a habit. I have a, a, a discipline about when I get up to pray. Early in the morning. And uh, I've been keeping it up for a while. But this particular day... Um, I overslept. So, when I overslept a couple of hours later, I woke up feeling very guilty and condemned. Someone knows what I'm talking about. I said, I'm sorry, Lord, sorry. I was supposed to get up at such and such a time to pray because that is my discipline. That's when I, I do it. And the Lord said to me, Peggy, it's okay. You're tired. <laughs> I didn't even wake you up because you needed to sleep. You see, sometimes we forget this is a relationship. He says, there's no guilt. You pray now that you're up. We'll talk in the course of the day, whatever. You know, that's what brings your prayer life back to life. Because now you realize you're talking to somebody. You're not just sending prayers by email. And they're bouncing back unresponded. <laughs> to. You're talking to somebody that's talking to you. And there are times you pray and the Lord says, okay, I've heard you. Now pray about something else. Are you following what I'm saying? Sometimes it doesn't say anything, but you just feel that peace, that assurance, that this I don't need to worry about anymore. That is what keeps your prayer life alive. It's not about all these other things that we add to it to think, ah, I'm the prayer warrior here. I pray five hours. God says, you just spoiled the whole thing. <laughs> it's not about how much you pray in hours. Do you love me? Do you have a relationship with me? Do you listen? Sometimes you, we just need to come before God. I'm, I'm talking now. I'm just talking to you. Sometimes we just need to, to come before God and, and just listen. I've come long ago to the conclusion, God has more important things to say than I have. 
And we miss out so much on real prayer because we think prayer is about God listening to us. And then we go. And God's like, well, don't you think I have something to say? So it's okay just to come before God and be silent. It's okay. And say nothing. And just listen. But you see that religious thing. I know I must say something. There must be something to say. Say something. Say this is God now. You must say something. But maybe God is just saying just chill. I've got something to say to you. Now we're going to pray. Let's take this 20 minutes, 25 minutes, and I'll tell you what we're going to do. We are not going to have any kind of ritual. (laughs) I'm not going to tell you where to pray, how to pray. I'm not going to tell you anything. But we're going to pray. However he leads you. If you want to pray sitting, pray sitting. You want to pray with your eyes open. God did not say, close your eyes and pray. It's not in the Bible. The reason we do it is for ourselves. Because now my eyes are open. Then (laughs) Then I'm distracted by something. Now I'm I'm, I'm no longer on track. We we close our eyes. It's not about whether you kneel or you don't kneel. God is looking at our hearts. Because we can kneel with our physical knees and not kneel in our hearts. And so, that's what we're going to do right now. Okay, wherever you want to go, take your time. And we're going to log off right now. God bless you. And God help, you know, lead you even as you do this. And it's not about how long it is. It's the fact that you are just going to relate to God in prayer right now. And major on the grace of God rather than on the works. Amen? God bless you.